Welcome to the Everything Coworking Podcast. This is your host, Jamie Russo. Thank you for joining me. We're going to dive right in with one quick reminder, which is that our next cohort for the Creative Coworking Partnerships course, aka management agreements, rev shares, things like that, starts September 27th is our first call. So if you want to join us, Get all the details at everythingcoworking.com forward slash management agreements. So we're going to talk today about why the coworking brand, The Wing, failed. So there are a few things going on here. So let's just set the, set the stage about, you know, what is The Wing? What is its business model? Our series that we're working on this month is the co-working business model. So we talked last week about small spaces, the challenges, the opportunities, and we're going to talk about the business model around the wing because I think it's a really interesting case study. So the wing what is it just announced a couple of weeks ago that it permanently closed its doors. It was very abrupt, no transition for its members. So we're not really going to talk about that here. Um, the wing had been absorbed or, you know, kind of bought on a fire sale by IWG, which is the, one of the very few public shared office space brands. Um, it owns brands like Regis and spaces and others. So very big thousands of locations around the world. And the wing had become part of that brand of families. And I suspect they were kind of on, you know, probation and had to, um, really kind of have a strong comeback or else they were going to be let go. So The Wing is a brand for women. Um, it's a little bit of a political brand, um, gorgeous spaces. So I've been in two of their locations in Georgetown and Washington, D.C. and in San Francisco. Uh, roughly 10,000 square feet. I love their aesthetic. Really beautiful, you know, pretty feminine spaces. Uh, they probably spend $200 a foot on their build out, give or take, but pretty high end build out, uh, all open plan. So they have meeting rooms, but no offices and very, you know, sort of well-known for a couple of amenities, uh, one being their like beauty bar. So this idea that you could work out, I think they had some Pelotons and the mirror product, and then gorgeous, gorgeous locker rooms <laughs> uh, and like sponsored products in the beauty bar. So you could go work out and then get beautiful and stay and work. They also had um, small cafes only open to members, coffee, light bites, things like that. And then kind of big like event uh, areas because they would bring in speakers. So um, that is kind of like, you know, just to sort of set the stage um, I think some of the challenges, uh, well, let's start to just kind of go, why do people join the wing? So I think people join the wing. I, when I visited the location in Georgetown, it was empty. There might've been a handful of people in there by handful. I mean, seven to 10 in 10,000 square feet. There was no one there. And why is this? I don't know. Really hard to say. So another important aspect of their model located in central business districts, right downtown, very high rent districts. So in San Francisco, they might've been paying $80 a foot, maybe $90 a foot. In Georgetown, I don't know what Georgetown rent looks like, but they were in the very high rent shopping district uh, where all the like, you know, high-end clothing stores are. So probably also a pretty high rent district. So central business district, high rent, 10,000 feet of open space. So I will say the... Georgetown location, when we toured, it was during the week, very quiet, said they have a thousand members paying roughly $200 a month. So that's kind of interesting. And so my takeaway there is people in that market, at least wanted to be a part of something. They really resonated with the messaging of the wing, which I will note is very like female forward and pretty political. Um, so if you're not political, you may struggle with their messaging. And I would say, I, you know, without getting into like politics on the podcast, I just don't align with, like, I don't need politics in my workspace to overlap. So I was very into their aesthetic. I joined the location in San Francisco in March of 2020, pre-pandemic. So I wanted a place that I could go sometimes in the city. And I wanted a place that was open on the weekends 
because real estate is so expensive here that coffee shops, you cannot go and have a coffee and think and sit in a cup. You can't do it. They're too busy. They don't want you to stay. You got to keep moving. You cannot go sit at a Starbucks, not happening. So there's no place to do that. So I said, I'm going to join the wing. And on the weekend, I can go use their cafe and do some thinking work sometimes, or during the week when I want to go, you know, get out of the house. So um, love their aesthetic, don't really align with their very political messaging. But I think there's a segment of folks in major cities where there are a lot of women who are um, just maybe like out there looking to be a part of something and align with something and have disposable income because they were not, didn't seem to be using the space very often. So they don't need the space. To them, it's more of a social membership. So think of like the social club model where I have access to this place. I'm going to go listen to speakers. I can bring my girlfriends. I think you could bring a large number of guests. So I could have my girlfriends. We could have a glass. I think they had, you could have wine. Um, we could have coffee. We could have lunch. Great place to meet people, which is another reason I thought I'm going to join because if I have people in town, I could meet them there. And I love that. Great atmosphere, perfect location, all of those things. So a high volume of people not actually using the space in a high rent district, purely open space. So very discretionary membership. I don't need to be a member at the wing. I don't need it for my business. I want it. And that's was certainly my thing. I don't need it. I want it. They did require at the time that I joined you to commit to a year. So it was pretty inexpensive, 200 bucks, which I think was full access, um, which is very inexpensive for San Francisco. Um, in your market, that may not be that inexpensive for San Francisco for full access pass. You just had to commit for a year. You didn't have to pay up front. So I, when I went into the San Francisco location, I was only there twice. I think I toured and then I went in and joined. No one there. On the weekend, I was there on a Saturday fully staffed. I think there were four or five people working the floors and the cafe had to be staffed. No, I was, there was like one other person there. I'm not exaggerating. So they're open on the weekends. There's no one there. This is pre COVID. It was a beautiful day. There was no reason for people to not be there except who goes to a co-working space on Saturday. Not very many people. So, you know, there there's, they had really deep staff, um, big spaces with no offices, and so it was completely discretionary. And um, my company, Everything Coworking, accelerates the launch and growth of coworking spaces. We spend lots of time helping a lot of operators decide how big their space should be, what their product mix should be based on their profit goals and their access to startup capital. And not ever would we tell someone to open 10,000 square feet of open space in a high rent district. Uh, very challenging model, even pre-COVID. So post-COVID, some of this is just timing, right? Bad luck, bad timing for this group. They had some leadership problems. I'm not going to get into that. I'm I'm really just kind of analyzing what I think happened. I didn't work for the wing. I didn't see their PL, but I'm just guessing because I know the co-working business model really well. And sometimes I see people post things on LinkedIn and I'm like, you have no idea what you're talking about. There are lots of reasons why this business model didn't work. But bad luck, bad timing. COVID. So post COVID they're all in CBD locations. So nobody's going, they're super high rent. They're not getting breaks from their landlords. So they're covering a huge rent nut every month for 10,000 square foot, a very premium location, no offices. So no one kept their memberships during COVID. They didn't even ask people to, I was a member COVID hits. They put everybody on hold. And then they say, you know what? We're closing indefinitely don't pay us. And so there was no liability to keep paying them at all whatsoever. They didn't even ask, you know, lots of us were trying to get our members to hang on with us and help us stay in business. They didn't even ask, they just gave it up. And yet I'm sure they did not have rent forgiveness in the types of properties that they were in. So, you know, there, that's a huge, huge liability for them that probably no one listening could have gotten through. So without some support from IWG, that probably would have put them under just bad timing. And then coming out of COVID, you know, everybody, so they lost their entire membership, you know, because it was completely discretionary and they just let people out of their memberships. So post COVID, it would have been a complete rebuild in locations, in markets where people just aren't going, right? This is not a neighborhood location. It is 
the financial district in San Francisco. I think they were in the West Loop in Chicago. They're in London. They're in Manhattan. So cities certainly are coming back, but it's discretionary. There are no offices. People don't need this. And so they would only do it to become a part of something um, and, you know, and no private spaces where people feel safe. And, you know, the whole period sort of in 2021 where, you know, mass, no mass, very challenging for that model. So, you know, but think about it. I think they were always going to struggle no matter what, because how many times can you replicate that model in, in any smaller of a market than the ones they were in? I'm not sure it works. They would have had to have been doing much smaller spaces, which I think is an interesting discussion point about this business model. Because last week on the podcast, we talked about the challenges of small spaces with a traditional office heavy model. So the wing has no offices, but a thousand members in their Georgetown location. So what if they had a smaller space? And what if the space was primarily event space slash social club? And the occupancy is never actually that high, um, but they can, you know, fit half of their members for an event. You know, the space is super flexible. Maybe it's 3,000 feet, maybe it's 4,000 feet, whatever it needs to be in order to put half of their membership for a big name speaker in, or it's in a smaller market and they're not getting, you know, headline acts um, in town because they used to have speakers that were very well known. I can't think of any examples right now, but um, big names. And so I think that was part of the excitement of being a member. But could the wing have succeeded with less than 5,000 feet? I suspect absolutely in the markets that they were in. They simply did not need all of the space that they needed. Or be, could they do a larger space, but put in some high power investors, you know, female run agencies in offices. And then you've got the membership for everyone that is almost gravy, right? You pay your rent with the offices and the kind of anchor tenants, um, as we sometimes, you know, refer to our bigger members. So really, really kind of go after the, this is the place where women, high power women come to support each other. I do think that the wing went after a segment who wanted to come together sometimes. So um, I don't know much about the model of the chief. Some of you may be following that. I'm on their email list. They are for C-suite women and they're mostly online. I do think they're doing some physical spaces. I suspect they're probably... Who, let's see what their business model is. Um, but they started online, I think. And so therefore connecting C-suite women who are not necessarily in the same town. I think the wing had attracted a segment of people who wanted to be together. It was not an online community. And so that simply was not a transition they were going to make post COVID. So, um, you know, kind of a lot to think about in terms of their model. So timing ended up being not good for them making a big bet on a downtown location, which lots of co-working spaces were doing pre-COVID. Their $200 a foot build out, that's a big risk. Um, but could they have done a really premium build out at a smaller scale? Because if you can pull in a thousand members in a market that want that premium feel and custom look, you know, or did they just completely overdo it? I do think that's a challenge with some of the premium brands. At some point, there's diminishing returns on that investment on a per square foot build out. So you have to be very careful about your premium premium positioning. Um, the cafe was members only. So I love the idea of diversifying your revenue with something like a cafe. Although we have to be careful, you have to kind of know how to run both businesses. Jen Tomkey was on our podcast and she had a separate cafe and a separate co working space, and they were two very separate businesses. We had the folks from success space on recently, and they talked about how they're really integrating the cafe into their model and supporting operators in terms of learning both businesses so that they can diversify their revenue in a smaller footprint. Um, but the cafe is open to the public. And that's a big part of the model, the wing cafe, not open to the public. You have to have an extreme amount of traffic into a members only cafe space in order to make the numbers work. Even if you're just serving coffee and paying a barista, unless you have a really premium priced model and that's one of your member benefits and then size. So they, you know, produced a product mix that I don't think aligned with their size. And, um, 
you know, it just didn't hold on to members when the market shifted. So I think that's really it for the wing is they had a really, really challenging model. Maybe it worked in major CBDs, central business districts in very big markets like London, New York, Chicago. Those are the biggest cities in the world, you know, but could you put one in Phoenix? I'm not sure, you know, it, could you put a smaller one in Phoenix? Probably. Uh, but they also did something, we talked about this on the podcast last week, which is if you're going to go for a smaller model and you're going to try to really make it something compelling, you're going to go after the high volume membership. You have to really have a platform for that. And I'm blanking on the woman who started the wing, but she was an actress and you know well-known and they had a platform when they started, which started to attract women really quickly. They got big name speakers to come into their space. They had the platform, the tools, the audience to generate memberships really quickly. And most folks don't have that. But if you have that, or on a, even on a smaller level in a smaller market, then it may be something that you can accomplish. You just have to be really realistic and really kind of weigh the whisk weigh the risk if you're going to go with that approach. So just a few thoughts on the wing. If you have any thoughts, would love to hear from you and stay tuned for next week's episode. We will continue our theme on the co-working business model.